welcome everybody to um, Stress-Free Productivity by HIT Leadership. So I'd like to start with some facts. Because what we do as an organisation, we look at training material research. So if you look at the first one there, five times more, what do you think that is? It actually is a McKinsey a Global Machine looking at collaboration within the organisation. If you have a collaborative organisation, you will have five times more productivity than another organisation that doesn't. And the next one, 25 to 30 percent, this is an increase. The Harvard Business Review, they did a massive research with thousands and thousands of organisations. And they looked at how communication and collaborative measures were working. And they worked out you're 25 percent more productive if you have great communication between all layers of the organisation. And the last one, 60%, this is huge. Now 60% more productive if your employees are mentally resilient. Now can I see a show of hands of people who think productivity within the workplace is important? That's good, good, because you're in the right place then to identify that. It's vitally important. And we're gonna go through the five layers of, um, the five piece of productivity. We're gonna look at how this increases your profitability and your revenue, but also look at mental resilience as well. And I'm gonna throw in a few stories, because, you know, it's a story day, isn't it? We're just like trying to engage with people. So first, thing, first of all, my name is Mark Rowley. I'm the founder and leader of um, HIT Leadership. HIT stands for Honesty, Integrity and Transparency. Uh, transparency so sometimes we are too honest but you can never beat it honestly someone asked how honest well are you and I said well if I see a lady with lipstick on her teeth I will tell her because it's the right thing to do and it's honest but also we tell organizations where they're going wrong but work closely with them so I have a master's degree in leadership and management and um, I've been increasing productivity for over 24 years in, in my corporate state and I've been teaching mental resilience for 17 years and I'll go into how I got into that. So I'm actually a qualified counsellor. Now, I'm not telling you this to brag, because it never used to always be like that. I think in 1990, I lost a lot of my team down to poor leadership skills. I had the worst employee survey rates within the organisation. I had to do a very steep learning curve before I um, was given my marching orders. But also in 2006, I broke my brain. I think that's the only way I can explain it. But I had extremely poor health down to a poor coping mechanisms, which I'll talk about in a moment. But this, this all led me into looking into what productivity is and how I can increase it and how I can build something to actually help organisations as well. So all the productivity is, is doing more with less. If you really want to really basic and talk about it simply, it is doing more with less. It's doing more output with minimum input. It's as simple as that. But it is such a fundamental fact that without having certain elements within your business, you're not reaching the maximum and not being the best version of yourself. And this is what I'm trying to go through today. Now, it's only half an hour, so I only have a short period of time, but um, I'm sure they'll kick me off if I talk too long. But I think what we want to do is trying to go through the five P's of productivity. I've talked about why it's important. The five P's of productivity are people, processes, products, partners, and perseverance. And we're gonna go through these one by one. At the end, if you'd like to ask any questions, please do, that's not a problem at all. But the first thing is people. Now, when we talk about people, we're not just talking about leadership and managers, we're talking about employee engagement. We're talking about the way that the employees are motivated, the way the employees are infused to do the work. At the end of the day, each employee comes to work to do a job. Now, is, does anybody know the word equity? Okay, so it's not equality where we treat everybody the same, it's equity. Everybody's different. We're all culturally different, we all come from a different background, we all come from different parents, unless there's any family members here. But we all come from different areas and we all don't, you know, we think differently. We know our diversity as well, we need to understand that. So when we teach and motivate and train our employees and look at them, we, we need to understand what the motivators are. For example, I had someone in my team 
who was a very quiet gentleman, quite a big fella, and um, he basically wouldn't come out to any of the events, and he would just get on with his work. But I was a bit concerned because he wasn't talking to, with everybody. He's not actually highly involved. And what it turned out, I, I had a conversation. First, we had an hour's uh, performance review, 15 minutes, talking about the goals he was reaching, how he's doing, is there anything I can do to help? And I asked him what, what his coping mechanisms in life and what it, what it was his life's choice and what did he want to do? And I found out that all he was doing was saving up for one of these big, big bikes, you know, like those BMWs or Harley Davidson's or one of these cruiser bikes. And he was going to go all around um, Canada. He was just going to ride over and that, that's it. He was going to backpack and he was going, that was his dream. The only reason why he was working, he wasn't married, he didn't have kids, he didn't have a lot of family. He was saving up for the lifetime you know, that he wanted. He wanted to retire and just drive his bike around Canada. But there's nothing wrong with that. It's a fantastic dream, but that was his motivation. So once I understood his motivation, I was able to work with him and say, okay, so do you want to earn more money? It was, well, yeah, it would help me achieve my goal quicker. So I thought, okay, let's look at that. Let's look at, do you want to increase your managerial responsibility? No. Okay, so you want to do more, um, more work, more hours, more flexibility. Yes, yeah, so once you start to understand that, that's just an example of one person. And if you're managing 10, 20, 30 people, each one of them has a different reason why they're there. If you could say, oh, okay, I'm there because I'm, I want a salary. It's not. Everybody has a different motivation. There was one lady who she was a sole um, carer for her elderly parents. So she was coming to work to get a, a break, but also to pay for the care for when she was at work. So that, that was another fundamental thing. So I could not put her on any other uh, th uh, things outside work. I couldn't put her any, on any shifts or anything along those lines. So I had to understand that she wouldn't be able to do them. So I wouldn't put her in that difficult si situation and ask her. And I think that's really key. I've got on here as well for leaders and managers. So I've talked about employees. But when, when we lead and manage, we're not telling people what to do. We're infusing them, we're motivating them to do the work that we've asked them to do. Now you can say, how do you motivate someone? Well, okay, you motivate them financially, but you find out what their rewards are, what their goals are. Now it could be they want to learn more, so you put them on more training. But whatever it is, you learn to motivate people for what they're motivated for. And what we do at HIT Leadership is teach empathetic leadership with humility. And I'll talk about why shouting at your people is the worst thing you can do. Losing the trust with your people and putting them into a position is wrong. Now, I'm going to explain a situation where uh, there was a, a really big golf store. Golf, you know, a little white ball that gets hit around it, it's ruins a good walk apparently. But this golf store had a fantastic manager that engaged with their employees. You know, they had little games set up, they really engaged well with their, their customers. They would stay there after hours if there was a late delivery that came in. They were really on board, they were part of the team, they saw the vision, they were there. Well unfortunately that manager had to leave and what can be described as a toxic manager came in place who micromanaged and basically said to them, no, you have to come in this time and you're not leaving until I say. It's got rid of all the games, ruined all the fun within the business, the customer retention went down so, uh, the, and the employees went down. And what would happen as well, a delivery would turn up at half five. But nobody was invested in that golfing company anymore and they all left at five, so the manager had to do it himself. And that's just how quickly a business can fall. If we don't have the right leaders and managers in place, that's where productivity goes down. One of the other P's of productivity is processes. And you might say, what, what, what's that got to do with anything? Well, I've worked in businesses where those processes are so complicated and so long-winded just to validate the existence of a role. I'm sure we've all been aware that sometimes you follow a process and you think, well, why am I doing it? And someone said, well, we've always done that. Well, I'd like to tell you a st story of my friend. He used to put a beef, um, big, big joint of beef in the oven. But before he put it in, he used to cut off the end of it. And I said, why, why do you do that? Because I went around for Sunday dinner. I said, well, why do you cut the end of the beef roll? 
he said, well, my mum told me how to do that. I've, I've always done it. She did it, so I do it. So I said, well, phone your mum and find out. And he phoned his mum and said, so, mum, why, why do you cut off the end of the, the joint of beef before you put it in the oven? He goes, I, she says, I don't know. Your grandma used to do it. I said, okay. Well, can you phone grandma and find out? And it transpires that grandma used to cut the end of her joint of beef because her oven was small enough. It wasn't big enough to have the joint of beef in it. So it's learned behaviour. So we have these situations where procedures are passed down generations and we follow it through. Did you know the QWERTY keyboard? Do you know how the keyboards are set up? Do you know why they were set up like that? Those words are set up in a way it's to stop. Remember old fashioned typewriters where they had those big things that used to come up and, and hit the paper? Well, they used to hit each other if the keys weren't in the right place. So now we have computer keyboards where it's not mechanical, set up like that, and there actually are a lot better ways than the QWERTY setup. But because we've always done it like that, we continue. There are keyboards, by the way, um, I can't, I'm not going to say any names or anything, but you can find keyboards that aren't QWERTY, they're set up, and it's better for your wrists and for your fingers. And once you learn how to use it, it's fantastic. But that's just another example of where we follow something blindly without questioning it. And that's why we need to question stuff. Um, on, honest, and then you have to have that honesty within your organisation and that trust and, honest, and openness to be able to have those difficult conversations. Now, really having that kind of um, a continuous improvement framework, does anybody know what that is? Okay, a few, there's a few knobs, uh, knobs, nods, sorry. And um, yeah, Freud didn't slip there. And um, those nods have indicated that people do know what a continuous improvement framework is. Now all it is is a process to be able to gather the information in, and these could be, hello, I'm from accounting and I found a different way of doing stuff. It goes into a part, it's looked at once a week, you can process it through the company, look at the, um, way that it's delivered and actually see if it's valuable for the company and that's how you so if you have that kind of continuous improvement framework in place you can actually follow those uh, changes through and make those changes to procedures that are, is vitally important so we look at the third p this is partners now this isn't just suppliers this is customers as well so if we look at customers as a cash cow, just some way of get bringing revenue in, it's, that's wrong. We need to build those long-lasting relationships. You never know where that relationship will go with your customer. We have to be transparent in our communication. I've, I've worked in organisations where the, the honesty wasn't there and they'd hide things from their customers. And then the customer would find out. And you imagine that trust being broken. It just ruins the relationship. And you know that customer will cancel their contract for the end of the contractual period. And this is where we see a lot of problems uh, in companies where they, ha they have, and by the way, I love salespeople, they're absolutely amazing. But if you just have a salesperson who's got a target just talking to your customer, and you haven't got someone else who's just invested into the relationship with the customer, you may have a few problems. Unless your sales team are averse with account management, then that works really well. And the same applies to suppliers as well. So suppliers are vital to our business. Now I'll give you an, a, an example. So Dell in 1995, they set up the Dell Direct, um, D Direct Mail. And it was a way that they worked very closely with their suppliers all around the country so they could actually deliver things quickly and they didn't have all their money spent on in, um, inventory within their warehouses. If you put all your money into your inventory, you haven't got enough money to do your marketing and your sales and all that other stuff. So having that in place, they actually passed on those savings to their customers. So when you pass on those savings to your customers, the customers are happier, everybody is it's a winner. Now, there's different ways that you can measure that customer happiness. Does anybody know what um, CSATs are, customer satisfaction? I can see nods. So that's brilliant that you understand that, thank you. But it's also, you've got NPS scores, the so net promoter scores. So it's those different ways. But there's nothing better than going and sitting face to face, seeing the whites of their eyes and asking them openly, 
how they are doing, how their family is, what, what, what are they engaged doing, what they're doing in the next 12 months. That kind of collaborative work really builds those relationships up. The fourth P is perseverance. Now, I am a qualified counsellor, so I help people with stress, anxiety and trauma, amongst uh, also being a productivity consultant. But I help people understand that a two hour workshop that is a tick box exercise in many organisations is not the way to go. Mental resilience is a journey. It's something that you build on. Mental resilience works when you have loads of things that you're doing on a daily basis, but you also have an understanding within the business what burnout looks like, what stress looks like. Some people never get stressed, and that's fantastic. They've just got that kind of personality type. They never get stressed. Other people won't realise when they're stressed. Have you ever had it when you've gone on holiday and after three days of chilling out, you feel weird? You feel like there's something wrong? Or you don't feel normal? Well, that's because you've calmed down and you're not producing cortisol. So cortisol is what's produced when we're in stress. So within 10 minutes of being in stress, you're already losing about 50% of your cognitive ability. Your cognitive ability is your, billion, um, your ability to think problem solves, communicate correctly. Some companies have factored in the faults of their employees because of that and they know it. Some companies will only have someone working in a position for four years because they know how stressful it is. But what they're failing to understand is the long-term effects of stress are catastrophic, they're hideous. Irritable bowel syndrome is caused by stress. One of the things that causes irritable bowel syndrome. It can cause um, heart disease. It can cause you to, it's a trigger for Alzheimer's as well. So they're looking at this and I, I don't see it causes it. It's a trigger. But it has such a detrimental effect. If you're living in stress, it affects your family. It affects your ability to work. And as an employee, employer, you're looking at your return on investment on your employees. You want to make sure they're at maximum productivity levels. So why wouldn't you look at, look at mental resilience and identifying and providing information for them? It's so vitally important. And it, it just helps so much. I'd like to give you an example now, a personal example. So I mentioned at the beginning, it's 2006, uh, when I broke my brain. Now I was working 80 hour weeks. My wife had just given birth to our second child. Uh, my coping mechanisms were drinking and smoking. I was in the right state. Um, and it got to the point where I had post viral fatigue. My heart rate was 210 over 120, something ridiculous along those lines. And um, I, my brain broke and I was bedridden. I was bedridden for three to four months. This means I could just barely make it to the toilet. Sorry to be too graphical. But that meant that I was bedridden for three to four months while my wife had given birth to our second uh, child. So not only was I broken mentally and physically, I was also suicidal because of my failure as a man to be able to help my family. And it wasn't until, I remember I was uh, lying in bed and we got some bamboo outside the window and I could hear it rustling in the wind. I could hear the birds chirping and I was still not in a good place. And my two-year-old daughter came in now, I need, to, I need to tell you, she's, uh, she's very, very good at smiling and being happy, but she came and jumped onto the bed. Didn't jump, she actually had to pull herself up and they'd been two years old. And she looked at me and said, Daddy, what, bro, what's wrong? In a, in a real childish way, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do the voice because that would be disrespectful to my two-year-old daughter at the time. But that, that caused me to cry, I just burst into tears. What she did, she pulled up my t-shirt and blew a raspberry on my belly. Now what I need to tell you here is when she was crying, when she was grumpy, we used to pull up a t-shirt and blow a raspberry on her belly. And that was a way that she'd start giggling. So she was just using that beautiful innocence of a child to snap me out of my, my mental state. And that's when I started to learn everything about mental resilience. You see, this is what stress does. It, it can ruin families. 
you see the rates of suicide uh, for, for men particularly going through the roofs at the moment. Men don't talk enough, but that's another subject altogether, and we need to talk more. So that was just to give you an idea. So the way you can do this, you teach people how to meditate. Now, not everybody can meditate. If you're neurodiverse, you can't. But you might understand that actually building Lego, doing a jigsaw puzzle, crocheting, um, anything along those lines, think that that's all that meditation is. It's focusing your mind on something singular. But other techniques is learning emotional intelligence. So that's where you self-regulate yourself, you understand where your triggers are, and you then reframe them in your mind to understand what they are. But all these have a massive effect on people. And no one is ever going to go, stand up, I'm stressed. There might be some honest people in, the, in, in, um, in your work environment who will say that, but there might not be. And as managers and leaders, we need to find out who they are and make sure that we can help them. Because if you want to get your return on investment on your employees, you do everything possible to do their job right. Not dictate to them, not tell them what to do, encourage them, motivate them, work with them. You're a, you remove blockers, simple as that. Now when we're looking at products, so you're looking at um, ways that your revenue streams are working. So I know a, of a company, I'm not gonna mention their name, but they had four different product lines, solid product lines. Two of them were service, and one, uh, two, the other two were physical. But one of the physical products was actually a loss leader. They were actually losing money on it. But they said they had to sell that as part of building the services up. And we worked with them to actually change that and make and find different suppliers so actually it becomes more viable. But unless you look at your revenue streams or your products, you will not understand that. But it's also understanding what your markets are doing. So look at that diversification as well. Can, can you all remember Blackberries? Yeah? So Blackberries, they were a leading mobile phone provider. They failed to keep up with the Joneses. They failed to have a look what was happening in the market. And they got left behind. I think they do cyber security now or something along those I'm not sure. But they, they, I think it was in um, 2012. They finished doing mobile phones. So that's just a... That's just a um, a situation where a company failed to keep an eye on their products, on their revenue streams, and I, I'm going to look through. Now the R&D, that's research and development, so that's looking at the way that you test and qualify your products as well. So there could be better ways, quicker ways of doing it when you look at your processes, how you're doing it, but it's all the same. It's always looking at that market share and looking at how they work. Now I've gone through the, the five P's of productivity. But what happens if your company is resistant to change? So we're all human beings. When we have change happen to us, we want to revert back to where we're comfortable or what we've been doing for years. You know, if you're in an organization where you have seen that occur, there's something called business change management that has an absolutely brilliant effect on bringing people on board, identifying the people who are detracted from that that you're trying to change actually make a difference so if you are implementing any change within any organization get yourself a business change manager who can really make a difference you can do it in-house as well it's just finding out but explaining as well so if you don't communicate why the changes happen why it's making a difference to the organization or to your employees then you will have a problem People will change if they understand the reason behind it and are on board. If they're not on board, you can bring them on board by understanding why they're not. And you can only do this with good communication and business change management. It's one of the lesser known things that businesses fail on, and I've seen this happen a lot of times, where you, you put in change for change's sake, it's an idea at the CEO level, you make that change, it gets filtered down, lots of money is spent, we're putting little stickers up around the office, there's a poster here, there's a poster there, an online training of half an hour and boom, that's it. Well, that's not how business change, you're, that you're forcing the change. And we all know we don't like to be forced to do things that we have, we don't know the reason why we're doing them. Some of us are more compliant than others, some of us are more hot-headed than others, but at the end of the day, to understand what it is and why they are against it, business change management works. So when is the best time 
to do business change management or to do the five piece of productivity. But there's an old Chinese proverb that says you should have planted a tree 20 years ago and the next best time is now. You cannot afford as a business to sit on your laurels. If you're making some money, it's all looking good, it's great. But things can go downhill very, very quickly. If you use the five piece of productivity, they will look so well. And if you go to stand R314, you can get, give your email address and we'll send you, not this presentation, but a five page PDF document that goes through each of the areas and goes through the areas discussed today. But it really, really does make a difference. That stand R314. And we will help you do that. But we're also looking at uh, behavioral and personality tests. That's just another a gimmick to get you to come and, and sign up, really. But I think it's, um, it's again, that's my honesty. I do apologize. But uh, remember, there is only the best time is to do it now, not later on. Now, sometimes looking at the five piece of productivity, you think, I can't afford that. And when I talk about motivating employees and enthusing them, you're thinking, oh, that's actually going to cost a lot of money. It's not. It doesn't cost money to change attitudes and behaviours and put processes in place. Mental resilience, it doesn't cost money. It takes time. And it takes time to put those things in place. But there's lots of free things that you can do to actually get online and help people understand that. Because the long-term effects, we're still finding out. I study psychology and neuroscience, and long-term effects of stress are far-reaching. And I wish I knew about this before I broke my brain in 2006. I'm glad I did, because I'm now here helping people understand the difference between what real stress does. Because there's two different things. There's you stress and there's distress. You stress is good stress, is short bursts. Distress is the bad stuff that you don't really want. So thank you very much. I appreciate your, your patience. Thank you.